name is Louis Zaki, and uh, I'm here to tell you some things I think you don't know about polyhedra dice shapes. I was the first person to make polyhedra dice in the United States back in 1974, and in 1980, six of the people that I was selling dice to and had been building their reputations as excellent dice manufacturers were telling people that they were making my dice and that's how they got into the dice business and that's how most of the people who are in the dice business today got there. One of the things that disturbs me is people who don't make dice for a living continuously complain to me about the problems that they perceive are, are just unforgivable. But that they don't seem to remember that from 1974 till 1980 when I was the only person making dice there was nothing but opaque dice available and all those opaque dice have the same problem that my gem dice do except that you couldn't see it so nobody ever bothered to complain about it. People come up and they say what's the matter with you every one of these dice has got a little bitty blemish at the bottom why God Bless America, if you knew what you were doing, you could get rid of that blemish. Don't you realize how badly that's going to make the dice roll? Other people can make dice without that problem. Why can't you make that dice without problem? So I have to tell them the facts of life are that improbable as it may seem, dice, just like plastic model airplanes and plastic model tanks and plastic model cars, are cast on a casting runner. And you have to clip it off the casting runner in order to get it separated. And this is the result of what happens after you cut it free. But because all my competitors are using a shortcut to get ink into the digits, they don't seem to have that problem, but they do. And so the first thing they do is they put their dice into a rock polisher and they tumble them with a very coarse material to polish off that blemish, because if they don't, paint's going to lodge in there and it's going to be very obvious. After they have tumbled them to remove that blemish, they put the dice into a French fry basket and immerse the French fry basket into the bottom of a paint bucket. When they pull it out, every dice in that french fry basket is coated with paint and it's now red or white or black, whatever the paint color was. After the dice have dried, they're put back into that same rock polisher and they're tumbled again because you don't want all that paint. What you want is a contrasting color in the digit. And so the second tumbling removes all the unwanted paint from the outside of the dice. And at the same time, it's destroying all the edges on the dice and it's removing the vertices on the dice. But that's okay. When the dice have finished tumbling that second time, they now have blemishes, scars, and unsightly scratches all over the surfaces, which nobody likes to look at. So then they put the dice back into a rock polisher, only this time the rock polisher's got a very fine medium and it tries to polish the dice and bring them back to a more acceptable appearance. Now as you look at this dice, you can see that it has lots of luster and fire. And if you went to any of my competitors booths, you would notice that every one of them has a great big lamp shining down on their display to make the dice look as lustrous as mine. But I don't have a big lamp and I don't need one because I'm using the premium grade materials. And the premium grade materials cost more than the cheap stuff they're using and so they can't get to the lustrous appearance that I have. Now, as a result of having put those dice in that rock polisher three times, this is what comes out. The first stack of dice you see there were, were dice that I took out of Red Box Dungeons and Dragons. And I stacked them on top of each other, and then I took ten more dice out of Red Box Dungeons and Dragons and stacked them on top of each other. It should be apparent that the first stack is three quarters of an inch taller than the second stack. If all those dice came from the same source, why don't they reach the same height? And the answer to that question is because all those dice are egg-shaped. And the dice in the first stack were stacked with the number 1 facing the number 20, while all the dice in the second stack were stacked with the number 9 facing the number 12. Which means that the dice are going to behave like everything else in nature. They're going to try to find their lowest center of gravity when they're rolled. Those dice will roll lots of 9s and 12s and very few 1s and 20s. If this was a dice and you threw it, would you really expect that dice to land like this as often as it lands like that? 
would you expect it to land as often like this as it lands like that? And the answer is no. When you take an egg out of a carton, it always rolls over on its side because gravity is pulling it down to its lowest center of gravity. And that's what's happening with dice as well. So a lot of game masters prematurely kill off characters that deserve to live, but the game masters are using rounded edge dice that cannot roll saving numbers. And you probably heard the story of the game master turns to the player and he says, George, your character's dead unless you can roll a 20 and save him. And George says, gee, where's my green 20? That's the one that always rolls high. And he pulls it out, rolls it, and he saves more often than the law of averages says he should because that dice is short on the 120 axis and that's why it rolls more 20s. So here you see gem dice that were made by TSR and they have the same problem as the opaque colored dice that were made by TSR. This is a diamond color right here so you can see through it but I thought if I made two stacks of diamonds they might not be able to see it. These are dice that were brought in from Germany by Koplow. These are the Armory's finest dice and then these are the dice that come in from Taiwan that everybody sells and puts their name on and pretends that they make but they don't. And then these are my dice. Now, people have said repeatedly, your dice have got that blemish and it's going to make them roll funny. What's the matter with you? Why, why do you sit up nights putting this scar on those dice? Well, to show how important that blemish is, I made two stacks. One of these stacks has no blemish facing no blemish. The other stack has blemish facing blemish. And as you look at the tops, you can see that those dice pretty much reach the same height in both stacks. Now, the answer to this question is, which of them is blemish to blemish? And the answer is that the black stack is blemish to blemish. And how you know I'm telling the truth is when you look at this, you can see lots of eights and twos. And the reason you see lots of eights and twos is because the clip mark is always on the same side. So when you put the blemish down, you're going to get the faces that are adjacent to the blemish. And so, what we have here are dice that will grant you equal access to all the faces that they have. A lot of people come up and say, don't you have a dice that rolls high? Oh, and I say, no, I don't, but my dice don't roll low either. They will give you equal access to all the faces that they have. They will do what a dice is supposed to do, which is randomize. Now, my dice have sharp, crisp edges for a very good reason. These are casino dice. Casino dice are required by federal law to have sharp, crisp edges so that they will surrender a uniform amount of energy as they gallivant across a tabletop. But cheats who want to take unfair advantage of an unknowing player will trim one one thousandth of an inch off of every one of the edges where they want the dice to continue in motion. And they don't work for a living, they just roll dice and cheat you out of your money. So, you may see somebody do something like this and what they're doing is they're looking for that one one thousandth of an inch gap between the two faces. And when a dice has not been tampered with, you see it's one continuous surface. But if somebody's been tampering with it, you'll see this little hairline crack between the two dice. And that shows you that that's one of the faces where the guy has trimmed a little bit off the dice. Now, one one thousandth of an inch is enough to allow this cheater to make huge profits pretending to gamble. Those dice are more than one one thousandth of an inch shy of being uniform. But my dice are absolutely uniform. And it's really important in the performance of a dice to know. So when I show you these dice, I'm going to point out some features that you've probably all seen in your friends' collections, but you didn't pay attention. As you look at this 20, do you see that the hook on the 2 is missing, and the bottom is missing on the 20, and there's two breaks in the 0? That's because this dice got polished on this side so often that it, it lost that. Then the next dice to it has no hook, but it's got its bottom and the zero is pretty good. That means that this edge right here is sharper than this edge over here. So the radii of every one of the edges is, un is unique to every single one of the dice. Furthermore, each dice has a different space available as the surface on which the dice is going to rest when it stops moving. Look at the third dice over here and you'll see a perfect two and a perfect zero. And what that proves is that the mistakes you see on the first two dice you looked at is not something that the mold did wrong. Because if the mold couldn't complete the two 
that would repeat on every single dice that came out of that tool. But you see a perfect two, a perfect zero, and you also see a line under the 20 and a line under the 11. What people who don't make dice don't know is that there was a line under every single one of these numbers before the dice went into the rock tumbler. And the unskilled worker is told to leave them rolling around in that tumbler until he can stick his hand in and pull out samples that have no lines under them. And that meant that this dice, which didn't need any more polishing, continued to get it anyway. And that's what made this dice uh, a misshapen piece. And if you were here in person and you could look, you would see that this dice is physically smaller than this dice on the end. Now, I need the assistance of a pretty stranger, and you look pretty strange to me, so why don't you come over here and demonstrate something else for the camera. I have here two dice that were made by that process. You can see that the flag is missing off the top of the five, and there, there are other problems, but I'm not going to point every one of these out. What I want you to do is to put the triangle on the bottom dice in exactly alignment with the triangle on the top dice, okay? Right. And hold them in your hand up at eye level. Any particular side? At eye level. No, it doesn't matter, because you're going to see the same problem all over the dice. No, hold it up at eye level where you can see what you're doing. Now, turn towards the camera. Do you see a gap between the top die and the bottom die? Or do those edges all meet? No, they don't. They don't meet. Does the dice on top feel a little bit unstable? Very little, but I do feel it. Yeah, okay. What happens is as these dice get tumbled, the edges get destroyed and the vertices are destroyed and it leaves the faces with a surface like the belly on a pregnant woman. And so they can't meet and it causes the dice to continue in motion. I have just reached into the bin over there and pulled out two of my rejects. This is my garbage. I want you to do the same thing with my garbage dice that you just did with these dice from Taiwan. And when you put those edges together, do they meet? Yes, sir. Okay. Do the dice feel like they want to tumble apart or unstable? Not They're really, solid no, contact, sir. right? Yes, sir. Okay, now if you'll hand it back to me, and bring the camera over here, what I'm going to do is roll all four of these dice with one hand at the same time. And when I release the dice, they will all have a uniform amount of energy and you will see the round edge dice continue in motion while my dice, the red ones, stop. Because the edges are going to do what the edges are supposed to do. They're going to, they're going to give me a random outcome. Did you see how the orange ones continue to move. All right, now I have a lot of people come over here and they don't know what they're talking about and they say, oh, I like them rounded edge dice. It takes them a long time to stop. That makes it really interesting. <laughs> but it's not supposed to be that way. That's why casinos have sharp edges on their dice to give you random outcomes. But these dice roll killer numbers and the guy who owns them says to himself one day, you know, it's a long time since I've seen a 20. And then he thinks, oh, it's probably just my imagination. And so as, if he's a game master, he's prematurely killing off characters that deserve to live. But they can't because his dice can't roll saving numbers. <laughs> now, I'm not the only one that has been receiving complaints about blemishes on the dice. The, the armory had the same problem. People would come up to them and they'd say, look at that. Look at that clip mark! God, that's awful! Why, that's gonna make this dice roll terrible! What's the matter with you guys? If you knew anything about making dice, you'd spend some money and build a decent tool! Gee whiz, you ought to get off your duff and stop being profiteers and exploiting us with these faulty dice! And so they spent $65,000 to make this tool, which generates a dice that has no clip mark on it. Those dice look horrible. What happened? Well, well, but it has no clip mark. That's now, true. as you look closer at this dice, can you see a circle inside the zero? Yeah, that's called the gate. And what happens is that's where the plastic is forced into the mold cavity at 2,000 pounds per square inch. When that cavity is full of hot molten plastic with that tremendous pressure behind it, there's no room left to squirt in any more plastic. And that's the signal for the gate to close. Now the gate closes, but these dice have to cool because if you open up that bowl tool right now, out flows something that looks like lumpy gravy. And if you wait maybe 10 seconds and you open it up, out comes jello. 
all right? So you have to wait for that to cool. Do you remember from basic science, the teachers taught you heat expands and cold contracts? You got it. So what's going to happen is since this gate is closed, you can't squirt any more plastic in there, and that plastic cools, and as it cools, it shrinks, and that's called heat shrink in the, in the molding business, all right? And they're not deliberately trying to screw this piece up. It's just that with today's technology, nobody knows how to beat that heat sink problem. Now, I've had a number of people say to me, you know, well, are your dice as good as casino dice? No dice are as good as casino dice, because these are not molded. They're machined to one five thousandth of an inch tolerance to be used for gambling purposes. And most people who make casino dice require that the dice be machined to one ten thousandth of an inch to beat the federal requirement by twice. So their personal standard is even higher. Now, to make it more simple and easier to understand, if I had 5,000 of these dice that were machined right on the money, stacked up, and next to them I had 5,000 dice that were stacked, but they were one five thousandth of an inch off, that stack would be either one inch shorter or one inch taller than the other stack. You look over here, and I've only got 10 dice, not 5,000. I've only got 10 dice, and they don't reach the same height. So you can see that what's going on is when you buy these other dice, you get dice that don't do the job they're supposed to do, which is grant you equal access to all the digits that are on them. Now, there's a fellow named Frederick Meyer who came to me with these three dice, and he said, I bought all three of them at Gen Con on the same day, and I used them equally for six months of gaming. After six months, I felt the dice I got from TSR were unreliable and I put them on the windowsill and continued to use your dice for the next two years. You can see that even after two years, my dice look better than the TSR dice look after only six months of use. A lot of people come over to me and complain. Your dice cost so much more than the other people. What the hell's the matter with you? Why are you gouging us? Well. There's two things going on here. The first is that my competitors know what their dice are worth. And they know their dice are worth less. Therefore, if you want worthless dice for less money, you can go to any one of my competitors and buy as many as you want and you can afford. But the other thing you have to remember is that my dice are made from the best material you can possibly get. And fresh oats cost more than used oats, even though the used oats have only passed through the horse one time. When, when all my competitors jumped into the dice business, their big reason for doing so was to make money. And so they looked for the cheapest plastic they could get their hands on to mold. And this is an example of some of the cheapest plastic and what happens to it after you start to use it. The edges break down and they change color and the dice no longer perform the function of granting you equal access to all the digits that they're supposed to do. So they become almost as unreliable as the dice from Taiwan with the rounded edges, which become very predictable in the way they roll. Thank you. Now, you say you're not satisfied. You say you want more for your money. You say you're not believing what I'm telling you. All right, folks, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how I make dice. Now watch closely. I have here this big dice and I have this little pan to catch them all in. One, two, three, that's how I make dice. I knew you weren't going to like that effect, but I didn't know you weren't going to like it that much. Oh, well, that's all right. I know pity when I hear it. That effect is 10 years ahead of its time and it's just your hard luck you had to see it this morning. As a matter of fact, I got more applause out of four presidents of the United States when I did that effect for them at Mount Rushmore than I'm getting out of you guys. And they were stoned at the time. And come to think of it, they still are. Thank you.